All right, good afternoon, everyone. We're about to start. Um, today is the last uh, seminar for this semester. We're going to start again in February. Um, <clears throat> so hope you enjoy the semester so far. Um, it's actually my honor and pleasure to introduce the speaker today because we're friends for a while. We've been working together for, I don't know, 15 years. I know Francisco for at least 10 years, 12 years, Wait, it's two, 12 years, 12 years. And the one fact about Francisco, and I kind of confirm it today, is that he hasn't changed at all. I have pictures of him from 12 years, 10 years, eight years, six years. It's exactly the same. So we start believing that maybe he's an alien. Uh, but <laughs> OK, so Francisco has uh, done his PhD in uh, Oxford uh, on supernova type 1. And now he's an astronomer and senior scientist at the CMM, which is the Center for Mathematical Modeling at the University of Chile. And also he's uh, one of the members for the Millennium Astronomical what is this stands for? Astrophysics. Astrophysics, yes. Um, that's a, an actually a big effort in, in Chile to put emphasis and infrastructure into astronomy because down in Chile there's about 60, 70% of all the photons uh, collected from the sky are, are in, in Chile, They're all the telescopes. So the government has put a lot of effort into that and he's one of the 10 members, 11 members of that institute. Uh, and today he's going to be talking something that's been working for a few years now, which is uh, dealing with streaming of data coming from telescopes, and in particular LERSE, which is a system that he's leading uh, to collect as data come from the telescope, do some uh, processing, and uh, discover new stuff. So I'm going to let him talk about that, uh, <laughs> so I don't take away from his talk. Please welcome Francisco. Thank you. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so first, thank you, Paulos, for the invitation. And I, I, I would like to acknowledge Paulos' contribution to the formation of so many data scientists in Chile. I mean, you really, I lost count of how many students have been working with Paulos now. I see he's really having an impact in, in the country. So thank you, Paulos. <laughs> so, um, so this talk is uh, it's about. Uh, a new system that is one of the several systems that, that has been developed in astronomy to adapt to the new way astronomy has been done, which is really with lots of uh, telescopes with uh, big cameras that are producing large streams of data. So as you can see, the, this collaboration is uh, quite large, involves many people uh, from different institutions in Chile and the US. Um, but one important thing is that uh, in this group, you have people that are astronomers, computer scientists, mathematicians, engineers. It's really interdisciplinary, quite diverse in terms of disciplines. So, and Alert said the name is, uh, is this broker that stands for the Automatic Learning for the Rapid Classification of Events. And Alert is also a tree from the south of Chile. It's very similar to the redwood tree here in the US. It's kind of similar evolution. Okay, so. First, um, astronomy so far has been de de dealing with studying the more very distant universe with larger and larger telescopes and trying to see, uh, find objects that you had never uh, seen before, uh, basically they were, because they were very dim. But now with very large cameras, we are now able to study the, the evolution in time of the universe. So we, we can study very large, uh, volumes of the universe uh, in several times in, in, in one night, for example, and we can start discovering things that we didn't know about. So this is, uh, has a, it presents a very big opportunity for studying the, the variable objects in the universe, but also it's very challenging because in order to take uh, advantage of this, you need to build systems that are able to make sense of this stream of data and are actually able to tell follow-up telescopes to point to the right targets to really get the physics when it's available for you. So <clears throat> if you look at this plot, uh, which is luminosity versus characteristic time scale for objects that are transient, so things that appear and then disappear, basically what you see is that we have uh, 
uh, spanned all the timescales of about one day to several, several, uh, two weeks or months <laughs> quite well to very low luminosities, so very dim objects. Or we, can, we have observed very bright objects that evolve very fast. But a few years ago, this area here was relatively empty. And that is not because the universe is not producing any types of objects here, but it's because of the biases in the way we observe the universe. So as we get larger telescopes, we can go down here. And larger cameras, we can go left. So we are starting to cover this part of the diagram. So in particular, for example, the famous Kilonova event that was the electromagnetic uh, counterpart of the gravitational wave that happened in 2017 uh, was lying in the middle of this area. So these kind of objects are going to be able to be studied better with these new cameras. So this is the, the telescopes that I was talking about. And in here, I'm showing in the y-axis the field of view. So this is how large is the upper, the, the, sorry, the, the area in the sky, of the, the, the one shot uh, you can cover with the, the, the telescope. And in the x-axis, you have the, the light collecting area, the diameter of the mirror. So as you go to the right, you can go to uh, dimmer objects. And if you go up, you can start scanning faster. So to the left in this diagram. And in here, you see this. The combination of these two, the product of the two actually, is called the etendue, and is shown here as the sizes of these circles. So this one circle here that is really dominant, and this is called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, that is currently being built in Chile, and it's really re going to revolutionize uh, astronomy. But today we also have other telescopes, like Blanco, DECAM, Dark Energy Camera, in Chile, Subaru, Hyper Super Camera, in Hawaii, uh, CTF in California, uh, so they, they cover different parts of the, this space, but really the product of field of view and area is what lets you scan the, the, the variable sky. So in, in my talk, I will talk about two projects, actually. Very briefly, first, I will talk about the project where we use this telescope, the Blanco Dark Energy Camera, to scan this part of the parameter space. And this is called the HITS project. And, and, it, and what we were looking for was an event that was in this part of the diagram called the shock breakout, supernova shock breakout. And this is the first hours of evolution of supernova explosion. Okay, so in order to do that, okay, we started this, this project called the High Cadence Transit Universe, uh, so, survey, sorry, HITS. And what this did, I think I used this, but is, to let the Earth rotate and the sky move. Uh, and then you, you start pointing to a, a, a large area of the sky several times during the night. So five times during the night in this case. And this lets you study a very large volume of the sky with a cadence, in this case, of two hours. Okay? So this had never been done before in this scale. We did this for a few weeks. And we did not find what we were looking for. We did not find the first hour of, of supernova explosions. So this, are, this is a diagram that shows the important timescales in supernova. So supernova, for those that you don't know, are the explosions of, of stars. They can, they can come in many different flavors depending on the, the progenitor star. Um, basically, you have two types of mechanisms. In one mechanism, you have a white dwarf that is burnt and becomes an expanding cloud of radioactive material. And as, as, it, as it expands, the radioactivity is, is, is transferred into photons and becomes light. And then you have another type, which is massive stars with a very compact core that at some point collapses, forming a neutron star or a black hole. And this triggers a shock wave that sweeps over the star and then makes it also an expanding cloud uh, uh, that is bright. So going from minutes to days to years, you have all these different kinds of mechanisms. These are shock breakout related, depending on the size of the star. This is, so this is the, when the, the shock reaches the surface of the star. 
Then you also have the cooling of the, the star that is expanding, the shock cooling, and then you have diffusion of photons that are being released during the explosion. So this part. And what we were looking for were the shock breakout of red supergiant stars. So the largest stars that can explode as supernova. And we, the predictions were, were that this will uh, have a characteristic time scale of hours. Okay. But we didn't find this. <coughs> what we found is this is a collection of from the supernova that we observed. And this is the evolution in time in the, the, the points are the data and and the lines are realizations sampled from the posterior distribution. And what we saw is that supernova were rising with a time scale of days. We did not find this very brief peak of hours. And what, we, what, was, what this was showing is, sorry, is basically that this shock breakout was happening with a time scale of days. And this was evidence for very dense material around the star at the moment of explosion. But I will go fast over this because it's not the main point of the talk. But this was the main result, that the mass loss rate of supernova that exploded as the red supergiant stars was much, much larger than expected. So somehow, uh, stars before explosion, maybe years before explosion, start losing mass in a way that was not predicted by observations. So this was an example of designing as an experiment to find something, not finding it, and finding something completely unexpected. So this is just to show you what you can do when you have access to very large telescopes with large cameras. So many things that we did are shown here. We found this, did this analysis in real time was the first time we were the first group to do a deep learning model for a real bogus classification of the images. So you have these sequences of images and you need, to, you need to be able to tell very quickly whether they are real or not. We found many very distant uh, variable stars, the most distant known in the galaxy, tens of thousands of new asteroids, millions of variable objects, uh, the evidence for this material around supernova that we, I, I just mentioned. Also the first convolutional recurrent neural network application for astronomy, and even a new population of intermediate mass black holes that is currently in, uh, under review. Okay, but this is what we were doing as in between 2014 and 16. But then after, after running this survey, we realized, okay, uh, there's a new generation of surveys that are going to be doing this every night much better than us. We, we don't have access to 100% of the telescope time, but some of the data that these telescopes are going to be producing is going to, be, is going to become public. So perhaps we can listen to these streams and do the same science we were doing with HITS. So specialize in, in one part of this pipeline. And for this, we built this project, the Automatic Learning for Rapid Classification of Events, ALERSE. And with HITS, we were using the dark energy camera, and we were generating about 100,000 alerts per night <coughs> that we had to classify to find this supernova. Today, you have the Swiki Transit Facility, which is here in the US, in California, and it's actually producing up to a million alerts per night, typically much less, it's 300,000. So it nominally it was a factor of 10. And then a few years from now, we'll have the LSST, which is another factor of 10. So nominally it's going to be 10 million alerts per night. And we have to make sense of this uh, to find this very interesting supernova or maybe things that we don't, we don't know. So for us, it was a, the natural continuation from HITS to ZTF and LSST to focus on the alert stream of these telescopes. So how is the future of astronomy in this era going to look like? You have a layer of 
survey telescopes like LSST or telescopes in space, WFIRST, SKA in radio, or LIGO in gravitational waves, all of them scanning the whole sky. And then you will get alerts. Some alerts, some, uh, the rate of the alerts will be different for these telescopes, but you will be listening to the entire sky. Then you have a layer of telescopes that follow up the interesting events, the follow-up telescopes. And here you have multi-object spectrographs, uh, small robotic telescopes, very large optical telescopes, or even telescopes in space. So how do you choose which object to observe? For this, you need this new layer of brokers and TOMS. So TOMS is an acronym for Target Observation Managers. And basically, this intermediate layer of brokers and TOMS will work together to help connect the survey and the follow-up telescopes. TOMS will talk directly to the telescopes, and they will be listening to brokers. And brokers will be com communicating with TOMS for this process to happen more smoothly. Okay, so why, why are we doing this? We are extremely lucky to have access to some of the best telescopes in the world today, in Chile, and we have access to 10% of the observing time in these telescopes. So this is a, it's, it's a huge opportunity, but also it's a big responsibility for us, because we need to make good use of this 10% uh, observing time. So this is one reason why we want to build the broker that is really focused on this infrastructure. So how do you make this possible? In this new era, you, you don't only need the machine learning tools and um, data science tools, you also need to have a very interoperable ecosystem. So today, for example, when you observe supernova, you've, you, some telescope detects, detects a supernova, and then you say, okay, can, I will observe in a few days from now, or maybe next day, I don't know. And then you, 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 you schedule the observations. But in the future, with LSST, it's going to be like going fishing. You just sit at the telescope, and alerts will be coming all the time. So you just wait for a supernova to appear, and you just observe it. So it's going to be completely different. And for this, APIs are going to be critical. All this ecosystem of brokers, and the TOMS. So again, you have the survey telescopes that talk to brokers. In, in, part, in this case, it's uh, using a technology called Apache Kafka for message uh, distribution. Brokers do classification, filtering, cross-matching, and they will talk to TOMS, and also data exploration tools, like Topcat, Jupyter, Notebooks, etc. And then you have all this ecosystem talking to each other and will make this more resilient, more stronger. So APIs will be critical, also these specialized uh, distributed messaging systems like Kafka. And in the end you have really an ecosystem of all these brokers that will make the system more resilient and more diverse. You don't want to have the same solution for in any case, in, in, all, in all cases. So this, this, here's an example. Let's say CTF triggers an alert, discover an object that was not present in a galaxy, and that was not observed the previous night. So in that case, you get an alert from CTF to a broker. Then the broker talks to the tones, and they start working together to plan observations and improving the classification. This triggers automatic confirmation, so some other telescope confirms, okay, this is really, again, present, so it's not an asteroid. Then someone takes a spectrum, maybe the same night, and it finds evidence for interaction. So this is probably a very young supernova, very interesting. Then say, okay, I want to study the, the asymmetry of this uh, material. Perhaps I can trigger polarization observations during, within the same night. All the time talking to the brokers and the tones improving the classification. Then I do radio and x-rays. Perhaps a few days later, I can constrain the mass loss history of the, of the system. And then, after some time, I can build a model that puts everything together, and I have new understanding of the physics. But in order to get this information, you really need to act quickly. Okay, so Alerce is 
a Chilean-led initiative to build a community broker for SST and other large and survey telescopes. We have been working with Paulus in these projects for many years now, and it's so many opportunities here that it's really, it's, it's a huge endeavor. What are the goals of this project? We want to facilitate the study of non-moving, variable, and transient objects. We want to do fast classification of transients, variables, and active galactic nuclei. We want to be flexible, because we don't know what is going to be the interest in science in a few years from now. So we cannot be, have a rigid classification scheme with a rigid taxonomy. We need to be flexible to adapt. And we want to connect the follow-up and survey telescopes. So perhaps asking for help on the TOMS. We have had several meetings, to hackathons and, and so on, and we have a really diverse team in terms of disciplines. So here you have machine learning and statistics experts, astronomers, and computer scientists, and also apart from researchers, we have a large team of engineers. Some of them working full time on this. So it's really, uh, for the scale of projects in Chile, it's, it's quite a large project. Something that we have learned along the way is that work methodologies are very important. The complexity of this project can grow very fast if you don't keep it under control. So we're following the agile methodologies, perhaps you have heard, they're borrowed from industry. And instead of having never ending meetings, you have one meeting every day in the morning with very clear objectives that you try to achieve in the sprints of two, two weeks. You have a product owner that tells you what are the requirements. And if you build a, a team that is able to, to follow these uh, working methodologies, you can actually move very fast. So again, the scientific questions for us are the transients. So what are the progenitors of supernova explosions? What is explosion physics? We want to understand variable stars. So perhaps things that change uh, the way they pulsate, things that we don't know, or microlens events, eruptions. And we want to understand active galactic nuclei. So supermassive black holes, accretive material, and what you see is really the, the accretion disk activity. <clears throat> so if you're going to then receive this stream and tell the community something useful, perhaps you need a taxonomy. So building a taxonomy has not been an easy task because the universe is so diverse. So if you start with an alert, you first have to determine whether it's real or bogus, because some, sometimes some of these alerts are actually not real. Then if it's real, it's a transient or a variable star. And if it's a transient, it could be several types of objects, supernova, kilonova, tidal eruption event, gamma ray bursts, etc. If it's supernova, there are several possible classes, uh, depending on who you ask. Then there are things that are between transient and variable stars. There are things that are periodic, could be eclipsing, could be pulsating, things are in between, uh, things that have stochastic behavior, basically things with accretion disk most of the time. Um, and this is just a simplified version of the, the true taxonomy of the universe. So <coughs> this diagram is, for many of if you're an astronomer, you have, may have seen a, a diagram that is similar from Ayer, but this is, uh, expanded to the transient part of the, of the tree. So as the project evolves, we may have to include new classes, and this means changing completely your database, changing your, classi your classification models, changing uh, everything, so, so you need to be flexible. Okay, in terms of infrastructure, we are using, as I said, um, Apache Kafka for the distrib distributed messaging. We are using uh, AWS for storage. Everything is based on mi microservices. And for the database today, we are using PostgreSQL, but we are moving to Cassandra for LSST, which LSST is a database of billions of objects. And we are have everything dockerized in containers using uh, Docker and, and Kubernetes. We have simulated 
the rate of alerts that we get we will get with the LSST, and we actually we can manage to get the, the stream process. It's doable. The difficult part really is for LSST is going to be database. So we're experimenting with Cassandra, and so far we have gotten good results. So I think it's it's doable. We can achieve the level of reaction of speed that is required with LSST. Okay, so what's, how does the, the pipeline of Alerse work? So as I said, there are many brokers, and this is our flavor, this, the Alerse pipeline. So you have the alert stream, and what you get in an alert is image stamps, the new image, the previous image, and the difference, plus some metadata associated to an alert. So if you see this image, you say, okay, there's a new point in the, next to this galaxy. So it's very likely that this is actually a supernova. So we build a, a convolutional neural network classifier that tries to classify alerts based on one image. It actually works quite well. And this allows you to react much faster than having to wait for more points and trying to see the evolution and to say that whether this is supernova or not. We have this system working for four months, and we have submitted more than 1,000 candid supernova candidates so far. And about 10% of them have been observed and confirmed as supernova. With this, you can do your, your science. Then you can also, as the alert arrives, you can compare with known catalogs to do cross-match. So perhaps this object was already known, or perhaps there's some other information that is relevant for the classification. And also, as alerts arrive, you can start building the time series. So you do the aggregation of the light curve, and then you can start computing characteristics of the light curve. And this allows you to do a second classification that is based on the light curve. So we have a, two classifiers, an early classifier that looks at the stamps, and a late classifier that looks at the light curve. And in here, we have the very complex taxonomy. In here, we have a very simple taxonomy, and here, a more complex taxonomy. Then we also can do forecasting. So if you see the light curve, I can tell you, okay, in, in one week, this is going to be the brightness of the supernova. We can detect outliers. So this is also research topic, very, very relevant, very difficult. <laughs> and we can also do model parameter estimation, like what we did for, for hits. So imagine if you can get these alerts, you classify them, and not only classify them, but you get physical parameters. And perhaps I can tell you, this is an outlier because the mass of the star is completely different to the rest. So this will be qualitatively very different. So as I said, we have an early classifier, a late classifier, a taxonomy that is evolving. We do cross match. You need all these ingredients. These are the confusion matrices of the classifiers that we're currently using. So this is the early classifier, which, is, as I said, is a convolutional neural network, was in just the first stamps, and it does surprisingly well. So these are the, the classes are AGN, supernova, variable star, asteroid, and bogus. And look, it can actually separate AGN from supernova relatively well. And these are the classes that we use for the late classifier, the light curve-based classifier. So here we have the stochastic events, the transient events, and the periodic events. And this is just using a simple random forest classifier. We're still learning, we're testing many other things like recording your networks, but so far we're playing safe and learning along the way. So something we have tested and, uh, with the HITS data, and we want to also include in, in Alerce, is a combination of the two classifiers, stamp base and time series base. So this is work led by Rodrigo Carrasco Davis. So if I give you a time series of images that is based on the difference of uh, a supernova or whatever event, you will see this. And this informa the information contained in, in here is basically can be summarized in a light curve. So the flux coming from this point source is what is shown in the light curve. And in principle, I cannot tell you whether this is a variable star or a supernova. But if I show you this image, which is the original images before subtraction, you can see the galaxy here, and you can say, oh, maybe this is really a supernova. 
<coughs> so Rodrigo based on this time series of images, build this convolutional and recurrent neural network that was able to classify objects in a recursive way. As, as you get more points, you update the probabilities and you improve and improve the accuracy. So this is the basic idea. You are updating the state of the network with more images. This was the main result using simulated data. So as the number of samples of points in the, in the time series in, increases, your, accu your accuracy increases. And using the recurrent convolutional neural network, the blue curve gave you also green, gave you very similar results actually than using a simple random forest. So this was kind of unexpected. Random forest was doing almost as well as a recurrent convolutional neural network. Okay. And then we move from simulated data to real data and we got these two curves. So this is random forest doing actually better than the recurrent convolutional neural network and the recurrent convolutional neural network here, uh, very similar results. However, if you use your simulated data and add only 10, sam 10 samples per class, the, you fine tune your network, you retrain a little bit, the recall in this case improves a lot. So we move from these curves to here, and now the recurrent convolutional neural network and random forest perform similarly. And interestingly, at early, at, uh, early times with very few points, the recurrent convolutional neural network performs better. And this was our intuition from the, from the start of the experiment, that the RCNN will be able to classify things faster. Okay, so I think this has a very important message for the way we could do this in the future. So you can start with simulated data, you train your network, and then you add a few real data points to get this to work with real data. So actually, uh, I will not show this, this video. It's a, it's a video that uh, Google saw this result and got interested, and, and, but I will, I will skip it. I will <coughs> show it later. Just show some, some results. Uh, these are the, the, the number of supernovae that have been spectroscopically classified based on our alerts. So it's 117 uh, up to two, two, two days ago. And if you look at the distribution of the time between the first detection and the last time the telescope pointed at an object, you will see that, if, and you compare it to the time between the second detection and the last non-detection, you will see that there is a peak here with one point. So that means if you want to get very, very young supernova, you will have to work with only one stamp. Other, otherwise, you will miss this peak. So <clears throat> I think uh, this is really going to be the way forward also for LSST, working with an early classifier or an late classifier or a hybrid between the two. Another very interesting result if you look at the time between the first detection and the time that this object is reported to the transient name server, which is what the community uses, you will see that uh, most teams take about five days to report. And spectroscopic observations actually happen, happening uh, with a similar distribution. However, we actually take seven hours only. So, because we're using the first image only, we're able to report supernova much faster than the rest. <coughs> so this is really a very strong difference. Okay, so how much time I have? Okay, I will do some demo now. So bear in mind, the demo effect, but it should work. <laughs> yeah, light demo. Okay, so, Actually, yeah, first I will show you. So this is our main website where you can find instructions to if you want to use these tools. And I will start showing two tools. First, the 
with what we call the CDF Explorer. CDF is a tricky transfer fac uh, factory facility. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, and here you will be able to explore all the alerts that we have received, all the objects. And then we have another tool called the Supernova Hunter, which is what we use every morning to find the very fresh supernova. So I will start with the Supernova Hunter. Okay, so I will update this. And so here you can see supernova from the last 48 hours. Uh, so here you have the discovery date. This is really recent. And here you have the distribution of these objects in the sky. And here you have some score, which is basically a probability uh, of being supernova and the number of observations of these sources. So if I click in one object, okay, I will see, okay, this is a, a galaxy according to Aladdin. This is a, the last image, the reference, and the difference. So there's something here, it's clearly a supernova. Go to the next. Okay, there's something that changed very close to the center of this galaxy. And if I go to the next, similar story, something that changed in the center of a galaxy. Next, and here there's probably a, there's here something that it was not present here, but this could be a, a bogus. Here, this is probably a cosmic ray. So this doesn't always work, yeah? Ah, this is the Milky Way. Yeah, so you don't find supernova in this region because basically you cannot see through the dust of the galaxy. Okay, so, and then if I, in, in, if I go to one, this, this candidate that is supernova, if I don't like this candidate, I have a button to, to report that this is bogus. This will allow me to improve my training set and improve my, classific my classifier. And for example, I could, uh, here I can see all the information that is contained in the alert of this object, a lot of information. And I can also link to the main AlertSA website, which is here. And here I see the light curve, oops. So this is magnitude, which is a kind of the flux of the object. This is time. And these two points here are the detections that happened on the 14th of November and last night. So this is really, really fresh event. And these are all moments in time when, when the telescope pointed, pointed here and did not see anything. So why is it going up and down? It goes up and down mostly because of the moon. So when you have full moon, yeah, yeah. And here you have information about the object, links to different catalogs. And also I can click in these points and the image changes. So each, I can see the point associated to each point, the, the image associated to each point. And here I have uh, the classification probabilities. And this says, okay, supernova 99.9% .9 probability. And this, in this case, is right. Okay. And, and so you can follow individual objects. But now I'll show you the, the main explorer, the CDF explorer. Uh, this is a, the, what you see at the beginning. And here you have a search uh, area and results. So let's say I want to find all the supernova type 1A, which many people care about because they're important for cosmology. I do search and I get a list of objects. I can click on them and I can see the light curve. This is the time series of the supernova. This is the image and these are the probabilities. So in these cases, it's a bit lost between type 1A and type 1BC, but this lo really looks like type, type 1A. Can move to the following, following, perhaps not the type 1A, this is type 1A, type 1A, and so on. I can also look for perhaps other lighter stars, pulsating stars. Let's see here. Demo effect. Yeah, I was I was showing there, but 
again. Arolaira search. Here it is. Okay, and this is a, the, it's a star, and this has this light curve that is confusing, but if I do folded light curve, I can actually see the periodicity here. So we pre-compute the, the periodicity, the period here, and this is one, and another one, another one. And look at something here. So we have the random forest probability says that this is Aralaira with 76% probability. And let's see what the early classifier says. And this says most likely variable star with 60% probability, okay? Perhaps it got lost because, yeah, this looks a bit extended. Anyway, and so this is the explorer. Continuing, uh, yeah, just say that this also works in mobile phones. <laughs> Somehow the engineers thought that this was very important. And uh, apart from the web, web interfaces, we have an API service that you can use to connect programmatically with your own uh, analysis software. We provide Jupyter notebooks for you to explore the data, to actually access the entire database if you want, all the tables. And we, we can pro also provide an output stream for the toms to listen to. So we have a very well-documented API, uh, read the docs. Here you can, you can access the database, you can access the individual alerts, and also, you can access cross-match from this catalog that is provided by these people. We have several notebooks focused on the different aspects of the service, API, transients, variable stars, active galactic nuclei. If I have time, I will show. We also have a very simple cross-match service. That means I have a catalog of objects, and I want to know which of them are in CTF. So just upload a file a CSV file, and it tells you what are the possible counterparts in CTF. And uh, how much time do I have? Another five minutes. Five, five minutes, okay. So I'll show now the, the notebook of Supernova. Yes. Okay, so this is uh, the notebook for Supernova. And just to, for you to get an idea, you can actually connect to our database. You can see all the tables that we have. Everything is, is open for you to play with. Lots of things in, in our, and here I can, I can do a query to test which, for example, I can see, I can, I can ask for Supernova that exploded in the last 70 days and that have uh, probability greater than 0.2 of being a type 1 supernova. Here they are, 234 examples. I can plot the light curve and, and see the, the, also the stamps. So all from Jupyter notebooks, if you want to do this. We have similar notebooks for variable stars, for agents, and just general for the API. And asteroids, not, but this is something that if you're interested, we could work in, because we have all the alerts provided by CDF, not only variable objects, also moving objects. And this can be easily identified because it has been detected once. And also uh, in the stamp, we have a classification based on a convolutional neural network that tells you whether this is an asteroid or not. So just to summarize, Two, two, two last slides. The summary is that uh, we're building this broker for CTF and LSST and other large attendee telescopes. So actually we're working to, to implement another telescope which is called ATLAS. Uh, the, the interdisciplinary nature of the team is critical for this to work. And you need really a dedicated team of engineers if you want this to work. We're connecting uh, different communities in this project, which I think is also has a, a lot of value. And we have products that are, which are a living catalog of objects, early and late classifiers, 
uh, streams that are annotated and classified, different APIs, Jupyter Notebook examples. And we are learning from CTF to prepare for SST. And there are many, many open questions that we need to work on, many opportunities. And I think we are moving into this new paradigm of machine learning aided astronomy. So we're not going to be replaced <laughs> by machines, but we will have to learn to work with them. And the final slide, that I think this is relevant for people that are interested in working with Pablos in this, for example. Um, there are many, many questions in, in, related to the development of machine learning techniques here. For example, how do you deal with evolving and heterogeneous taxonomy? How do you work with highly unbalanced training sets? Maybe they are not representative of, of your test, of, of your real data. And also you have multiple domains. How can you do data augmentation? How can you work with synthetic or real data? How can you do domain adaptation? So if I have data from one domain, I want to classify in a different domain. How can you do outlier detection, forecasting? Can you do active learning? So actionable machine learning to uh, point a telescope and learn something about your data, maybe the most interesting points. And then you have the, the whole area of machine learning production, which is very challenging. How do you mod modularize and doc dockerize everything? How do you keep versions and the complexity uh, and the control? And which work methodologies do you use to achieve this? And then for the astronomers, the physical characterization, if I have all these deep learning tools, how can, how can I interpret them? Can I get physical parameters out of these uh, light curves in real time? Can I embed physical loss in, the, in them? And also, catalogs are going to become really probabilistic catalogs. They're not going to be like black or white. How can I work with this? So these are open questions to me and a matter of research, I would say. So that's, that's it. Curious to know uh, how often you train the models, as well as like other teams that are doing classification. If there is um, your classification, say something. Their classification say something else. What is the process to reconcile those differences? Yeah, I mean, as far as I'm aware, maybe someone knows. Uh, other teams are still not doing the classification with real data. Uh, yeah, is that? Is that We are using real data, and some, sometimes it matches, sometimes it don't, it doesn't, but it, it's mostly a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah, okay. So which, which? It's our own. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Classifier. Yeah, but I think if you start uh, doing like between groups confusion matrices, uh, it would be interesting to analyze the structure of these matrices. Perhaps this can tell you something about how reliable different classifiers are. So if, the, if there is a lot of noise in these matrices, class versus class, uh, that's not desirable, right? You would, like, well, you would like it to have a very clear structure. So I think this is one way to, to tackle this. Meta, Meta classifier as well, yes. So, so there will be brokers or brokers, yeah? <laughs> so there's many opportunities here, I think, yeah. Do you have mechanisms for capturing um, user activity as a way of getting labels? Like when you click on something and you can indirectly catch whether or not it was a false positive? Okay. Yeah, so we're, the first step to do that is was the supernova, is the supernova Hunter, where you can actually, you have to log in with your Google credentials in this case. And then if I log in, I can report, so let's say, this is a cosmic ray, then I can report, and it's in the database now. So we need to implement this for many uh, of the tools that we have, yeah. But just to get this working, we use this as an example. I forgot to answer uh, the, your previous question in the first part. <laughs> yeah, uh, we changed the model out 
every times, uh, every, every month, more or less. This is what we're starting to get to do now. Yeah. Yeah. One is uh, how difficult it would be for each individual to get all the data and do its own uh, classification <laughs> it as would, opposed to use a broker? If you have uh, enough computer power and storage, you could do it on your own. Yeah, but how, big is, how big is the problem? At least was the idea. Uh, I think it, in principle it could it, it, it could take you like a few weeks to do it, but if you want to have all the tools for visualization, for the tables in your database, all the interconnect interoperability, I think this starts becoming really a, like a, a big project. So I would not recommend to do that. I would recommend to use some of the brokers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the other thing is, how do we define alerts here? I don't think you yes, alert is, Anything that changes in the sky that is significantly a significant change. That means. So who defines the level of significance? Uh, uh, the survey that emits the alerts. So in this case, CDF says there is five sigma. Five sigma means uh, the, the the change is at least five times the the, the error. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the first thing you showed us, you said you were looking for some transient thing and you didn't see it. Does that mean that? There's a theory that's wrong or that they're not there, or what does that mean? Uh, it, I think it means that uh, there's something that we don't know, that red square giant stars do before explosion. And it had been observed in a few cases before, but in here we found that most of them uh, have this behavior. So I think there is something in the stellar evolution theory that we don't understand. In, that has to do with the envelopes of red square giant stars and their appearance before explosion. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.